Welcome everyone to Alaska Quarterly Reviews 2022-23 reading series. I am Ronald Spatz, Editor-in-Chief of Alaska Quarterly Review, and this event is being recorded and will be available on the Alaska Quarterly Review YouTube channel. Please feel free to watch any of our prior programs and to share them. Alaska Quarterly Review is committed to presenting these programs without charge and to showcase vibrant and diverse new and emerging voices and literary conversations with depth, complexity, and humanity. Like all literary magazines, AQR depends on grants, tax exempt donations, and subscriptions to operate. If so inclined, donations and subscriptions are gratefully welcome on AQR's website, aqrreview. Org. Before we begin, I'd like to make a few important acknowledgments. Alaska Quarterly Review gratefully acknowledges the Anchorage Museum for hosting and providing technical support for this event and to the Center for the Narrative and Lyric Arts, Alaska Quarterly Review's 501c3 umbrella organization, which makes this event possible. I also want to make a land acknowledgement. Alaska Quarterly Review recognizes the indigenous land on which all Alaskans live. Alaska Quarterly Review is located in Anchorage and Anchorage is the Nina homeland. The Nina is the language spoken by the traditional present and future caretakers of this land. Land acknowledgement opens a space with gratefulness and respect for the contributions, innovations, and contemporary perspective in, of indigenous peoples and marks our collective movement toward decolonization and equity. Today, I am absolutely delighted to feature two of our editorial team members, Tara Ballard and Sean Ballard, um, who will be reading uh, from their new poetry. Um, the way we'll do it today is I'm going to introduce them in the opposite order that they will appear. Um, and so I will introduce Tara first and then Sean. Sean will be the first person to read um, and then Tara will follow. And after that, we're going to have a short uh, conversation um, and just really excited about this. So um, to begin the introductions, Tara Ballard is, the, Ballard is the author of House of the Night Watch, New Rivers Press, winner of the 216 Many Voices Project Prize in Poetry. Her work has been published in Bellevue Literary Review, Michigan Quarterly Review, North American Review, Tar River Review, and many other venues. In addition to her editorial role at AQR, Tara is an assistant poetry editor at Prairie Schooner. Of Tara's poetry, Tarifa Faluza writes, with lyrical deafness, imagistic texture, and a willingness to cross and consider borders, and perhaps most importantly, a self-awareness of that crossing, Tara Ballard reminds us to not take our own sight and its capacity for granted. With the aid of poets such as Yehuda Amachi and Naomi Shabnai and others, Ballard reminds us that poetry allows us to speak with those who are near and far. Sean Ballard uh, is the author of the chapbook Flight, which won the 2018 Sunken Garden um, Prize Award and is published by Tupelo Press. His poems have appeared in Narr Narrative Magazine, New York Quarterly, The New York Times, Poetry Northwest, and other literary magazines. In addition to his editorial role at AQR, Sean is an assistant poetry editor at terrain.org. Of Sean's poetry, Hanif Adurabi writes, Sean Ballard's fight, Flight, um, and the title of his book is Flight, uh, finds innovative and brilliant pathways to step into the layered and complex voices surrounding the joys and perils of being Black in America. These poems are daring and musical, as alive as the people they are speaking to. So now it's my absolute pleasure to invite uh, John to begin the reading. And at the end, we will be coming back for a conversation. All right. Can you hear me? 
We're good. All right. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Ron. And, and your cat is beautiful. And, <laughs> and you're golden for being able to keep your focus while all of that was going on. So uh, thank you sir, very much. Um, <clears throat> and I'd like to thank Anchorage Museum. Uh, I'd like to thank Cody for hosting this. Um, and I'm excited to be reading with Tara. And I look forward to hearing her poems as well. So um, I've been working on a new collection of poems. Um, some of them are persona poems. And so I'm going to read some of those tonight. And uh, I'm going to start out with the first poem. Uh, Ron mentioned Poetry Northwest. And so I will be reading that poem that was published in Poetry Northwest. Uh, shout out to Poetry Northwest. Uh, so uh, this one is titled Anti-Pastoral. <clears throat> Anti-Pastoral. My mother fixes me between her collarbone and ear, like she is fixing me between the knees of her lap. And I am small and a child again. And she is aptly passing down a lineage of stories I have never known. Stories I'd like you to hear. My endeavor is never to keep you too long, which I admit could have been my grandmother's phrase, who I've only known with a bowl of white hair. I'm coming to it. But for now, allow me to reset the scene for clarity purposes. My mother and I are on the phone. Not one me in my grandmother's field, white as the ripening of harvest that rubbed her fingers raw and her mother's fingers wrong. Though I cannot say for certain that I lingered long in her ear nor stroked a hair upon her head. Worse than that, if I did, I cannot know if I had said anything my mother had not passed along. But I know for sure these hands have never known cotton sewn, nor picked, nor anything as white and light that can fit in a sack that at the close of a hand could weigh in at several hundred pounds with children in tow. So my grandmother took flight, a great murmuration of wings beating across the countryside into migration. Allow me to say it blunt. I have stood all day in the sun's brightness for no other reason than to darken my face. My hands find as murder, whispering all of this and none of this is mine. All right, I'm gonna set my timer here because I should have done that when I started just to make sure I don't go over. Uh, uh -oh. Just bear with me very quickly while I find it kind of a Luddite. All right, there we go. <clears throat> uh, this next poem I'm gonna read is a persona poem. Uh, I recently learned from my mother that uh, we are maybe related to the singer Johnny Taylor. Uh, and my mother discovered this, um, of course, from, from her family members, but also from a family reunion uh, pamphlet that on the first page, it had uh, a picture of Johnny Taylor and it said at the next family reunion uh, in Cleveland or Detroit, he will be attending. And so uh, I decided to go and, and uh, re-listen to a lot of his songs and I wanted to write a persona poem. Uh, and so that this is, this is a result of that. So this is titled, um, the ghost of Johnny Taylor encourages the long offspring of a Robin to jump and reminds himself that the first love to break his heart wasn't a woman at all. Did I ever tell you about the time I called out a man's name and my father never looked back? Now, each time I take the stage, mama asks, who do you think you are? I ask for the lights to be turned down it's better that way for a man to live until the only desire before me is a void. Picking cotton is hard on the feet. 
So I learned to open my mouth wide with one verse in the earth and one for the angel of the Lord. Sometimes in a spotlight as bright as the North Star, a man can burn the sweet of his sins. Or the way can be as clear as looking into the red tip of a cigarette. Baby, at the heart of every song that answers to the body's demands, begging, I mean a real deep begging, like an invitation to a soft bed at the end of a cul-de-sac is a prayer. So can you blame me if I drank from the well of echoes, like every city is my own to keep? Listen, baby, if I felt it, I sang it. If I sang it, I've done it. Our wings eventually take the flight of our father. What do you think all this leaving is for? <clears throat> the next poem I will read, uh, it's, it's a prose poem, so it's very easy to get lost in it. And I'm gonna try my best not to get lost. And if I do, forgive me if I pause. Um, my father and I drive to St. Louis for his mother's funeral and the wildflowers. There is a story and a journey a son takes with his father that circles back to a field of flowers, that stays a field of flowers only in name. And because our eyes pass them along the road, so there's a point in a journey when all the years blur the same, meaning the details it took to get there and the details it takes to get back. And there's a point in a journey when a volta pivots inside a narrative, when a father turns the wheel over to his son. And this is the moment when the father releases his child to the wind and the boy learns to fail or the boy learns to fly. And we desire shade from our oak trees where the robins watch their where the, where the robins watch their nests. And sure, this could be a story about how a parent never rests once his hands relinquish control. And my father never slept on that journey, though I'd see him doze. And we mostly ate fast food and paused for gas. So there's a point in the journey when the journey becomes a hill, a literal slope, somewhere between a field and Texas where our bodies enter a high point and there is a tension. And peripheral to, the, to a son and peripheral to a father are likely flowers blowing in the wind that could be from anywhere. And we could be anyone. And I could ask for anything. So there's a point in a journey where I become a magic lamp. And my father becomes a field of wildflowers. And the thing about a magic lamp is how gently the hands tremble once the wheel turns slowly onto the shoulder. So there's a point in the journey where I pull off the road and I am asked to exit my vehicle as if I had a choice. So there's a point in the journey when the frame holds and the heel steals more or less its green and the dandelions become a haven for the bees to stuff their pockets with gold. And by this standard, my father can no longer be likened to a field of wildflowers. And the thing about a magic lamp is I only get three wishes. And my father is being cross-examined as I make use of them all. So there is a point in a journey when who lives to tell the tale and from what point of view becomes central to the climax. And if the man toting the gun has a third person limited, and if the plane in the sky has a God's point of view, I'm all out of wishes. And the thing about a journey is at some point it becomes a prayer. And what I mean is, from this point on. 
And the man with the gun is all about the math. And see, what should have been viewed as routine does not start out that way. And what is likely to believe requires neither of us. So there's a point in a journey when it ends the way it begins with that which appears different on the surface. And the man holding the gun wants to know if our stories corroborate. And to think, all of this came from my being too relaxed, from allowing my foot to coast down a hill while I mistook a field of dandelions to be a field of wildflowers. And that was my mistake. And the plane that was said to have calculated my duration to distance before the age of drones is not put to a boat. So there's a point in the journey when I return to the math and I've never been one for arithmetic. So forgive me if the story does not add up. I leave this problem for you to resolve since I know you will work through my miscalculation. And the thing about a miscalculation is how a journey could end. And the thing about a journey ending is how easy it is to misfire. And what I mean is how easy it is to begin with a field of flowers and end with no flowers at all. <clears throat> all right, so I'm gonna be transitioning here from uh, persona poem to persona poem. So here's the next Johnny Taylor persona poem. And I will say that um, uh, I got this idea from Hanif, uh, who Ron introduced uh, uh, earlier uh, when he was introducing me. So um, the only thing that you should know that you will not be able to see is that it's a acrostic golden shovel. So on one side, it reads, it's cheaper to keep her, which is one of Johnny Taylor's fa uh, famous songs. And then uh, the golden shovel line is a line from his song. And it reads, when the judge give you that dirty look, you may as well put your money in your mama's pocketbook. One side of an interview with the ghost of Johnny Taylor given by the queen of a humble beehive above his grave. It's not all what you think when you see the lawn thick but want. When the man you know knows his work will bring him home again. The same home where he mows the grass like it's here to be judge, caseworker, an instant hit to my back pocket. You hear the crowd give half an ear, that's all. And what I promised them, nothing. Believe me, you enter here the same way I do, but it's not your walls. I walk down. Hear that? Appearance is everything, and ain't I green? I'll talk to that. Listen, baby, dirty pathways make dirty shoes, and these alligators ain't cheap, but it pays to look. Every dance ain't free, and every hotel's book. You hear the song, but you rarely get the music. Listen, baby, where do we go from here? Home in May? The sun, baby, ain't even gone down. Tomorrow's another sold out stage, as overpacked as a night can get. Even my sweat got a name. You are dropping the wheel. Keep your honey, honey, the night's on me. Yes, I can make a house a home and put every two step in its place. It only takes one glance to make a song. What's your excuse? Rhythm and blues, soul, disco, doo-wop, I've done them all. These money poplars are Monet's. My money don't grow on trees. Whether I close in Hollywood or Memphis, it's all work. And it all works the same. I'm gonna open your ears so wide you're gonna forget why you came here. Now, 
Ask me about my mama's ribs, baby. So I can say, you look like a good cook. But can you keep your hands out my pocketbook? All right. Looks like I'm doing all right uh, on time. <clears throat> so uh, a lot of these poems have been, um, have come to me through conversations with my mother uh, about her childhood, uh, about my grandmother, about my great grandmother, and uh, our migration up from Mississippi and Alabama into St. Louis. And so um, recently, one of those stories that came up was how my, my grandmother got her gold tooth. And so, um, and so I wrote a persona poem um, in the persona of my grandmother. So I'll read this one. The ghost of my grandmother looks out over a baseball diamond and tell, tells her daughter what she missed. Sometimes you can see a season bursting through an evening cloud. Yo daddy running into the house with a fist full of cash when the sun finally sets. You may call it turning over a new leaf, but I knew it for what it was before I knew what it was. He had thrown in the rent, the baby, and the bath water and went for broke. And sometimes the heart is a catcher's mitt and life throws us a lemon and we learn to make lemonade. It threw him an orange and he made a screwdriver with it. And sometimes the dealer threw in a wrench and he bet the house, tossed in the kitchen sink. Yo daddy, you must understand, was a man of his time. During an era where I'd smile through a pleasant breeze from a colored only window and a game of cards meant for three months, mama had to go down south. Or it meant daddy had three months rent. And yo daddy, had stories, child. Lord, he can talk the sun down over a city with lily white lips. And when he won, he'd enter the house like when. Tell me to hide his cash someplace he won't remember. Say, Lily, don't let me near it, no matter how hard I beg. And he could beg. And if that didn't work, he could swing for the fence. I think I will close with this poem. Uh, another Johnny Taylor persona poem. And uh, just wanna say thank you uh, for the opportunity to go first, Tara. And I'm looking very, I'm very much looking forward to hearing your poems, which I already know many of them and they're beautiful and you're gonna do a wonderful job. So I will close with this poem. Uh, this persona poem of Johnny Taylor. The ghost of Johnny Taylor, the philosopher of soul, tells the city how he and Sam Cooke left the country, but the country never left them. A song in a field is worth the same as a song in a church, and I've tied in both. And at the age of six, I considered the lilies of the meadows the same as the meadow larks. And sunset for me as a child was heaven held in a gold tooth. How I do marvel at the way life greets us in a sliver of a thing. Born arrested is not the same as born under a restful night's sleep. I desire my country count of sheep by name and not by number. I wish to exit this earth glorious as perennials in spring, an encore in a garden which calls me back. A little dirt hurts nothing. Nor do the roots of the Mississippi River envy the cities to which I cleave. Let me sing it play, plainly. Baby, I believe in you. You believe in impatience. How each 
can grow to light up a corner, to phase out any burden of proof. Proof. A little song could build a road that outlines a city block. Listen, baby, land is land. My want of earth is little gone now. What well, was that not in and of itself proof? Pardon my candor if I have grown impatient. The tent on my soil has passed since expired. Now it's time to give it all back. It's been a long time coming, like November's expression, come what may, come what might. Forgive me if I want what buds return. The night finds me guilty of such toils. It's a hard living. And I wish you only to grow sweet by the river, a stone's throw from where I've made my bed in every heart. That's how I survive. Listen to how I've conversed with you like someone not turning in his grave, like the dead don't sleep. What has been offspring of the tongue still is. Now, when you, now when you open your mouth, picture pure soul coming out, me running. My glide smooth as the first platinum plaque. See now, there I go again, living. Baby, I wouldn't ever entice your love to stay if leaving is all I got. Everyone gots to die to something. I've been ever since. Thank you very much for allowing me to read these poems. And it's all yours, Tara. Thank you, Sean, for those beautiful poems. And thank you, um, Ron, for the opportunity to take part in Alaska Quarterly Review. It's such a gift to be part of the team. And we are both very grateful. Um, I'm going to be reading a few new poems from a project where I'm looking at the intersections of racism and empire, uh, thinking about imperialism and um, what our nation does, and as a U.S. citizen, um, what I need to take into consideration. Um, with that in mind, I've been um, spending a lot of time with Shakespeare's Othello, uh, which seems to embrace um, both of those ideas, the fear of interracial relationships, um, the need for a military conquest. And uh, so I've been thinking about Othello a lot lately, and I would like to begin uh, with a quote from that play. Do you perceive in all this noble company where most you owe obedience? Okay, um, this first poem I'm gonna read, the title comes from Mariel Rookeiser's The Book of the Dead. And it's titled, Here is Your Road, Tying You to Its Meanings. It takes place in Greece. My mother's father sat at the table in the rented dining room where he wore his white undershirt and slacks and socks as if just returned from base, ready for a home cooked meal but the table was foodless and he filled a case of green glass bottles with petrol and fabric cut from the girls' outgrown blouses and skirts. It was evening in Glyfada and blackout curtains were drawn across each window, making invisible the pistachio trees that sweetened the courtyard. My mother asked her father a question, but I don't know his reply. I can't say whether his superiors knew what he was doing or if he decided alone, but he was an officer residing in a country not his, representing the interests of our nation at war, outright and by proxy. And sometimes we are the sum of our actions, and sometimes we are both a root and cause. And I don't think I ever met him, my mother's father, as I have never met my biological grandfather on my father's side, which is to say, I have these histories that blur like Polaroids shaken before my birth, but I cannot unclaim them nor unaddress what dwells outside the frames. And behind the cocktails being made at the table, there were geopolitical teachings that I must reckon with. That night, my grandfather made weapons in another country's home. 
and I wonder if he considered how much imperial power he poured into each of those bottles as he sat surrounded by his wife and kids, his teenage daughter, my mother, who watched him. And I wonder whether he ever began to doubt the contract, the promise to serve without ceasing. I wonder what it was my mother asked and whether his reply would speak to what it is I question now. Uh, this poem uh, engages directly with Shakespeare. Uh, the title comes from Othello. On the brow of the sea stood ranks of people and they cry, a sail. How far am I from the globe itself? Not the planet, but another heroic construction said to be named after Hercules and the earth he took upon his back in a gesture of kindness, which reads mythic, male, justification for what has been done and not. I am supposed to see the burden on its shoulders, but when I look at drawings and photos, I think of the arena, Panem at Circensis. Given its building more than 100 years after Henry VII sent Cabot oceanward to proclaim the right to Asia, 36 after Elizabeth charted Jesus of Lubick for the trade of humans as slaves, and three post her first edict to expel all blackamoors in residence, I cannot pretend the globe did not reflect what formed the geosphere around it. Can I shrug its name into coincidence then? a mere allusion to shape and therefore meaninglessness? Or do I consider what was performed, scenes that correspond to a kingdom's economic and foreign policy, portrayals of Venice, Cyprus, and Egypt unquestioned? The globe being the globe, the presumption of the name requires me to ask what it means to make the self a world interpreter. Like England did, my offshoot nation has declared center, just as I have been taught to center my person, though not like I should, not to reveal complicity nor to remedy dramas of fact or fiction, but to spotlight, to blind, and how this whitens the script. Even if documented records prove hostility by city officials against theaters, even if mapping demonstrates the globe was built beyond the line of control in rejection of the censor, and even if Shakespeare created challenges to the sitting powers, it was still 1599, and the playwright did not exist outside of his environment, just as the theater was constructed of materials that were delivered across the Thames. If wooden planks came strapped upon the actor's backs, what else became manifest, became real on stage? Um, and this next poem does not address Othello, but it addresses, it returns back to my family. It is titled Carrier. My father told me not to join the military, that Despite his own enlistment as a sailor and then a soldier, he did not want me to follow. I did not push why, but I knew where mom kept the photos of him in uniform. And I learned how to play battleship in my before school program. I loved the game. The attempt to track my opponent's fleet, the sense I was getting close to sinking another ship and another ship, that the numbers were shrinking, that there was only one left. I had the enemy cornered. And what moved through my body with this early exposure? I did not once consider the waters in which I waded, how with sunken ships comes drowning, and whether I believed those lives on those ships were worthy of grieving. I did not know how my country works to convince that certain lives hold value, that certain lives are constructed as not to be mourned. And I did not question why this game exists and who it benefits and what ideology it allowed me to drink as a child without understanding how salt would seep through my skin and leave my mouth dry and wanting. And when my husband and I cross from one state to another, we are often tagged as military, as there could be no other explanation for a couple who looks like we do mixed in marriage. This is assumed upon our re-entry after X years in X countries. As instructed, we fill out the form, 
name where we lived and the cities we stayed. The TSA agent looks at the two of us and asks if we are contractors or active duty. Why else would we stay away so long? No, we are teachers, we teach. At this point, a pause. My husband shifts his weight and we nod politely. Literature, yes. English, yes, which is, yes, also problematic. And though I did not push the buttons, I did not execute civilians or men and women my government declares to be disposable. I have, in fact, contributed as neo-colonial occupier because books too are made as are curricula, lessons on aesthetic, on what makes writing good and who should be read. And as a sailor, my father went AWOL outside of Boston. This was during the war, and my father's brother was already lost and unable to surface. He fell so deep that decades passed before my father would find him, and I am not sure if his clothing ever dried, whether he always smelled like my father does, still of salt and of ships, of metal and rust, but I tried my best to be a good daughter and a good citizen as per the education provided. I learned how to play the game at a young age. I loved battleship and did not wonder what it means to desert, whether desertion was necessary and whether desertion is what I must do, what I must choose, removing pegs from the grid and yanking the ships from their harbor, choosing to dry dock, to scuttle their powers, refusing to carry what I have been taught so long to carry. Um, I return now to uh, a poem that engages with characters uh, present in Shakespeare's Othello. And uh, the poem is titled, well, the poem in the title, it references the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act that moved to the Senate within the past mm, summer, I believe. Um, and unfortunately, the bill did not, the act did not get passed. Um, but the title is, while I wait for the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act to move to the Senate, I address the man outside. Iago, I have seen you twice now, both days in a row now, on your bicycle, in a neighborhood that is not yours, on the dirt road behind our home now, where you do not need to be. I have seen you register our presence and circle back and circle back close to the two of us. I am afraid of what weapon you might have in your jeans, you with your patriot hat, your bill pulled low, your patriot shirt, the country's flag turned sideways. Who are these terrorists your screen print instructs to run? When I think of terror, I think of men who look like you, your skin the same as mine. The sun will soon be setting and still you linger, you pedal slow. You have spent too much time watching my husband and me as we walk in the cool of the day, like lovers do, like anyone would, when the heat becomes less striking and the geese return to the creek and the robins return to their nests. Last night, I struggled to sleep, so busy my mind was, with trying to push the American nightmare turned repeat far from our resting selves. And here you are again. I want you disarmed. I pulled away from our bodies, our bodies warm with light and blood and living. Iago, I want you changed. I want you smiling, enjoying the May weather. I want you to greet us, to return our wave like neighbors. I wish you peace, please. We wish you peace. Um, this next poem, uh, I have two more, that's okay. Uh, this next poem returns again to my family. Um, so here we go. As children, my sister and I played risk in the basement or a reflection on the normalization of colonial measures. From our parents' 1975 edition, we maintained armies and decided which regions were for invading. It was a long contest. It took hours and we gave up without ever declaring a victor. 
which is to say, we could not come to a clear enough conclusion to announce our operations finished. So we left the board open on the carpet, pillows and blankets piled along the perimeter like levees. We told ourselves we would return after dinner or on the weekend, but never did. Not until the dog traipsed over the Eastern United States and Great Britain, dispersing units beyond recognition. By then, we forgot whose turn it was to make the next move. And I admit, there's a lot I have forgotten. And I have been thinking about consequences, those of inaction, and who I am bound to and what I must refuse. Choosing to remember that obligation to each other is what holds us human. Last night, I Googled the game. I have been thinking about the word risk, and the decision to reject positions of state. When there is verbal, alphabetic, bodily refusal, what shattering can occur? Um, and I will close with one more poem that I hope intersects all of these conversations, um, including, of course, a reference to uh, one of Othello's um, main characters. It's titled Self-Portrait with Exequy. I must dead Desdemona from myself, but unlike the film or theater, the procession will be narrow. It will low to ground and gather no stars. It will walk at dusk into a stretch of birch and cottonwood and spruce. It will walk barefoot across the moss and along the brambles. It will be quiet, there will be no weeping. To bury her, I will be alone. This is labor I must complete, not for noise nor moonlight, but to clear what has coated my lungs like an old sweater, my inherited cover. The shovel I know will clank against my ankles. It will leave bruises. It is not easy to rid the self of a self one has been taught to carry while outwardly denying its being. The shovel is my father's, rusted and given from parent to child. I will effort to balance its wooden handle against my hip as I drag her body through the understory. She will be heavy, so drenched her bones with the rainfall of script and portraiture. This far into the trees, her hair will clump, strands tangle, and I will see how she holds tight to what passes her, even as I work for her to die. To think I had not noticed what currents embed themselves within the flesh when, and with what efforts. When I begin to dig, the soil will loosen, cool to touch. Unlike her, it will lift with ease, having long been ready for separation. Daughter of the state, how I have leaned into you, onto you for reason. To explain away my silences and stumbles, the tripping I do among a system of roots, when I should have, need to, recognize my face in a lake's reflection, call the color of my skin and eyes, admit without flinching their meaning. I believe this death is necessary. I will it. I must lose this woman. I will dig deep enough for permanent burial deeper than the register of scavengers, how far she must go down to prevent my unintended return. What will remain will be the cracks of dirt that cling to nails, but the dirt will serve as my reminder. The dirt will help me clean. Clean. I want to become this. I want to birth a new, break from the hard shell of her, become a creature free from being made. Like a sparrow, I want to emerge from what I choose to crack and leave this forest with her in it. I want to enter a clearing I can finally see and greet my love as he should be greeted, love as he should be loved, as he has waited in every act for me to do. I will extend to him my hand. I will say, hello, my name is. Thank you. Those are, are great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Tara and Sean. Beautiful. And um, what I really appreciate about the both of you is, is that um, you take on 
real issues in your poetry. Um, but the poems are not polemics. They are lived experiences that are then reimagined and made larger and contextualized. Um, and so I think I wanted to start and I'll throw this out, maybe one kind of big question. Um, and then you two kind of talk it through. Um, as a married couple, you know, I think that it would be interesting taking it from a different, you know, your different perspectives. Um, but I think it also is informative um, to the rest of us um, how differently uh, and yet bravely you both approach these issues. So, um, so this is this is the way um, I, I want to frame it. Um, you know, as we know, the, I guess maybe this is a little bit hyperbole, but maybe not. The world is on fire right now. I mean, and we're not just talking about um, climate change. We're, we're talking not just the United States with issues. We're talking everywhere is spreading. There, there is a pandemic of fire and destruction. And that's on top of, you know, a huge earthquake, you know, if you want to imagine that just occurred in Turkey a couple of days ago, where they have, you know, unknown people killed already, 7,000 plus. Um, so within that context, uh, and the things that we are in control of as people, the earthquake and real life is hard enough as it is, right, for people to navigate that. Um, we're living in a time of absolutely human caused and invented polarization and conflict um, regarding all kinds of important things to the core of how we live, right? And who we are, religion, race, cultural ideas uh, and beliefs. And um, I mean, these, these conflicts um, are brought into your work, um, but they seem to, I mean, to me, and it's interesting because listening to you both read, they seem to blossom out from the particular of family outward. So your lived experiences early in life have blossomed for sort of a framework, I think, um, of how um, family or how you define family and history, historical narratives, um, and so on, how they work together uh, with your poetics, your vision, and maybe even your larger sense of the importance of poetry at all. So it's a really big question, but it combines um, a lot of, you know, I think what's relevant. And so I wondered, you know, if you can start with family because a lot of your poems start there. Uh, and, and then let, let's move out to, to how, how you connect um, with that. And then, you know, you don't have to be, you know, hamstrung by the family context because the world is on fire and not everything stems from family. Uh, maybe it stems from the human condition that maybe is the human family, uh, not your own individual ones. So I just uh, throw it open to you and whoever wants to start, go ahead and I'll remain quiet. And my cat is safely um, uh, now looking outside. Um, but I can assure you, and this is not a joke, the cat was intently watching you guys. So what the cat didn't want to do was here a boring introduction. You <laughs> <laughs> wanted to just get to it. And when you were done, literally, the cat, like in Sandberg's fog, a little cat feet without bumping anything, okay, just so. went over to the window on the <laughs> Okay, I throw it open to you. All right. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. Thank you very much for that question. Um, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Tara start because she finished reading. And so it's probably still fresh in her mind. So I'm going to let you go for it, Tara, and then I'll jump in. 
Sure, no problem. I'm thinking about family. That's an interesting word. You know, um, I come from a very small family. It's my parents and my sister and I. So in regard to to that definition, we're, we're very small um, and I love them dearly. Um, but I feel like family is also much more than that. Um, I have to look at where I come from, who I come from, um, and the historical implications of that. Um, if I expand it even further, um, being raised in the United States, I was taught that I have founding fathers, and the term is father, which means I then need to question what it is those gentlemen were doing and for what purpose. Um, and who benefited from their actions and policies. Mm -hmm. So to me, I feel like family includes all of these things. Um, and because of that, mm, I feel like it, it is a responsibility to address those issues in my poetry, even if it's uncomfortable. Um, and that's something I have to work on myself, right? As a US American woman of uh, European descent, um, as I have to, I have to grow daily my comfort level with being uncomfortable in discussing and troubling um, the difference between history from above, which is the narrative that I've been given, and history from below, which is that from the communities um, around me. Um, and so when I think about family, I feel like all of those layers come into what I'm trying to address in my poetry. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I think it's very interesting you mentioned history uh, from above, and I'm I'm in the process of of learning uh, a lot of that that connection with history in my own family, uh, which we're all familiar with the history here in the United States. Uh, but yes, there is there is a context that uh, I think uh, is is. As we can see, what, what's happening in Florida, it's 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 a context that is being um, what's the right word to say uh, decimated. I don't know. Uh, this, there's there's this history of knowledge that we have that, and I and I think to, I think about myself as a PhD student. How many books have been written that I have not read uh, that would have given me and provided me insight? Um, you know, about uh, my own family history. Uh, and so when I think about the Great Migration, you know, um, of course we know about the Great Migration. And, and of course there's this period that's from some say 1910 to, to 1970 when 6 million African-Americans moved up from the South uh, into these Northern states and my family coming from both uh, Alabama and Mississippi um, I, 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 I knew that, that history, but I didn't know the reason why, right? And when I think about the knowledge that has been out there, um, uh, the, the, the books that have been written, I ask myself, why did I never have access to those things? Um, and, and, and the case in point is thinking about Florida and, and what they're doing to make sure they block uh, this, this, this knowledge uh, and, and, and attack uh, these histories, uh, which is American history. So anyhow, um, so yeah, I've been thinking about how, how my grandmother moved uh, to St. Louis uh, and I still don't know the date, um, but I know that uh, in Mississippi, she must have owned some land or she was certainly sharecropping uh, and how uh, this was something that uh, many people in, in the area that she, she grew up in was doing the same kind of work and how they were struggling and how, you know, from 1910 to 1918, 1919, we were going through a world war and these shifts and uh, and my family was there for all of that, you know what I mean? And and going further back, I'm 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 locating my family and, and these plantations uh, that they were working on uh, 
as enslaved peoples. Uh, and so I'm writing, I'm writing myself to try to figure out, and, and there's no way of really doing that. There's, there's no way for me to really figure out how things were, but I'm trying to write myself uh, into a place where I can connect those stories, uh, or at least uh, the truth of those stories, even if it's not if it's not a true if it's not true um, or correct, and 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 it's and and it's history, but at least the truth of the poem is is what I'm trying to communicate, uh, and so I'm doing that. I'm trying to do that through Johnny Taylor. Uh, and I'm trying to do that through my grandmother uh, and these persona poems. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of how I'm trying to work through uh, family. So if I could, if I could um, <clears throat> just ask you a question. When you talk, where you were talking about Florida, um, mm. your context for that uh, is the educational uh, kind of um, kinds of proposals that are being uh, drafted in that state, mm -hmm. but in many others about how American history uh, needs to be uh, presented and mm -hmm. what should be included, yes. what not included, right? That that's what you're Absolutely. that's what you're referring to. I'm talking and, about the, the the attack on African American literature. The uh, so that on, too, right? Yeah, that's yeah. the new thing, right? So the Absolutely. new, so, so the newest thing that you're talking about is the AP curriculum. Absolutely. So you're talking so two different things, and they're both happening at the same time, but not only mm -hmm. in Florida. One is a generalized uh, kind of um, um, series of proposals coming from some states mm -hmm. where they want history taught in a particular way. Yes. And, and that means uh, there are certain things um, that they do not want to be covered. There are other things that they want to have both sides of the question, they say. <laughs> I say that because I have a view that, you know, certain things, for example, um, I mean, everybody who would really um, kind of internalize Judeo-Christian culture, just, I mean, mm -hmm. not the culture embodied in the way that it's played out, but, you know, if you look at the best aspects of, you know, the fundamental teachings, um, you would not um, ever think that slavery is okay. okay? I mean, that would just not be something you think is okay. Mm -hmm. So therefore, um, if you prevent, if you profess a belief in that as your underlying core, you know, spiritual nature, mm -hmm. then it would seem to me that you would not want to hide <laughs> if it had existed. Mm -hmm. uh, you would want to expose it consistently. Absolutely. So you wouldn't want attitudes um, to repeat themselves. Absolutely. And yet you guys are, um, uh, you know, in, in your own works, um, addressing that sort of thing. So there's that. And then mm -hmm. there's the idea. So there's a generalized history. And then there's the advanced history for students mm -hmm. that are accelerated, mm -hmm. that you do not want to have them experience something that they might be interested in, particularly, and where it's most a problem is where students don't have um, or in some places, at least, where they don't have an experience with the de dealing with more multicultural venues. Mm -hmm. If you follow, I mean, not venues, but different um, groups. So some places where there isn't really quite diversity, they seem mm -hmm. to be uh, not wanting to even talk about what may have happened elsewhere. Um, uh, so there's that. Um, so. What was is interesting to me is how poetry, uh, Tara, fits into that for you, uh, because you know Sean said he, he he's trying to you know get to you know he thinks it's important to tell that history mm -hmm. to whoever whoever will listen to it from a very personal perspective because that's the only way it's going to be not a polemic, right? I mean. Mm -hmm like you say, what happened and who people were, and you get to know people, you can, you can 
experience them and live in their shoes. Well, uh, you come from another perspective. Mm -hmm. And I was struck by this really amazing image. It's very powerful in one of your poems about you and Sean um, going th through an airport. And everybody expects that you guys are, if you're going together and it looks like you're a couple, the only way that would be possible is if you were in the military or tied to the military as a military contractor. And I think it's interesting um, because it's sort of like a double standard, like the military, you know, that is a sort of separate organization that has its own problems. But back in World War II, it was very clear that some of these um, distinctions, these racial distinctions um, were not uh, productive uh, for good morale and fighting forces and, and unification. So, and so, um, you know, you, you, you have to confront both of you, um, this astonishment um, that like, uh, like, oh, I understand the two of you. And then when you say that your teachers, um, they step back and they don't really uh, get it. So what I'd like you to do is let me talk a little bit about um, where you come from and what your, what your personal history may be like. Um, I mean, I don't think that Sean is surprised by, by what's happening. Um, I would have to think, you know, I mean, nobody's probably surprised, but if anybody's surprised, it would be more you. Um, because they're looking at you when they do that. They're not looking at Sean, they're looking at you. And so, and it's sort of a commentary like, oh, oh, they don't say anything else. Um, so how does that, how does that, you know, kind of manifest um, and inform your poetry? and who you are and how family, you know, you say you're in a small family and then you left it at that. Um, and then you went on to this big thing. So <laughs> I, I would like to kind of go back to the, the smaller one and just ask you point blank um, about how things evolve from there and what kinds of issues in the poetry uh, have to because I've read others of your poetry and so I other pieces of your poetry so I know that this is not a fair question to ask you um so how where does it come from and where do these things intersect so in other words where do these two ex, and, and it's Sean this is what I'm trying to get at where do these two experiences that are actually quite opposite I mean absolutely opposite experiences as kids contextually growing up, um, how did they, uh, you know, intersect? And then, and then what happens in the poetry because of it and the dynamic between the two. But first I wanna start again with Tara talking about the very particular thing that you said, well, we're very small, nothing to see here, too small to see, uh, yeah. except that, you know, I played Battleship, uh, but dad didn't want me to do that. <laughs> Because uh, uncle didn't, you know, it didn't work for him real well. <laughs> so that's the end of that. Okay, I'll, I'll be quiet. No, yeah. like, no, no, and, and that's given me a lot to think about. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, my my family, of, uh, it's an interesting thing because I, I feel, and it's not really interesting. It's actually very, um, very standard white middle class U.S. American. Um, uh, my parents um, raised my sister and I to enjoy literature and to write and to express ourselves. But there's a lot that, and that was this exploratory, wonderful thing, but there's a lot about my family on both my mother's and my father's side that I have no idea about and that they don't have any idea about. And so we're currently in this process of learning and unlearning together, um, not only about where we come from, uh, geographically, but also the things in which um, we have been indoctrinated without realizing we have been indoctrinated. And so this is something our family is working on together um, in various degrees. 
Um, I remember, um, uh, well, it was probably a couple years ago, uh, with the continued police brutality against people of color in the United States, and my mom sharing that because of her position of privilege, she never had to worry about police before. And now that her son is African American, she has a new set of worries. And she's working through those just as um, the rest of us as uh, white identifying family members are working through our privileges and what those privileges has made, have made us blind to. Um, you mentioned, of course, um, the Judeo-Christian um, traditions, and um, I consider myself a person of faith. And the more I learn, the more I consider my faith to be aligned with justice um, and forthrightness and um, repentance to be better, to make us better as community members, like you said so wonderfully. Um, and so because of that, I feel that then it's a responsibility to work through these things in my poetry because my poetry is part of me just as everything else is, right? Um, my intellectual life is not separate from my physical bodily life um, and how I enter a space is, is impacted by my identity. Um, and so when I think about that and the fact that my family um, we're learning and unlearning together and going through these moments of stumbling, lots of stumbling. We make mistakes all the time, right? Um, but we're trying to understand ourselves in relationship to our past, in relationship to our country's past, um, hopefully uh, to, to make progress. Yeah, I would just say, you know, I think, I think mistakes are all okay as long as we are doing that work um, and we are trying to work through those things and I think you know uh, you know I can't speak to to the idea of privilege but I what I can say is that as Americans uh, we have been kind of fed, fed the same bread you know uh, we have partaken from the same uh, the, the same kind of ideologies that have been passed on um, and so it's, we're all in the process of, 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 of breaking those things and, and working through those things. So I'm, I'm, I'm making mistakes. I've probably made mistakes now while I'm, while I'm speaking, you know, um, and, and I will probably continue to make mistakes. Um, but I think it's important that we don't make the same mistakes, but also that, that, you know, we understand that it is a walk um, and you will stumble along the way. Uh, but as long as, as you're making that effort and you're realizing that, um, that you have a role to play, uh, like what you're doing here with AQR and, yeah. and all the wonderful things that are happening with AQR, um, I think there are a lot of people that are out there doing that work. Uh, mm -hmm. And without uh, that partnership, um, nothing can get done um, because we know that those forces um, that don't want this partnership to happen, they're working just as hard. Uh, and so, you know, um, I agree with Tara, you know, we're going to make mistakes, but we have to keep, we have to keep moving ahead and we have to inform people of, of the literature that is out there. Uh, you know, as I said before, coming into my PhD, I'm being introduced to all kinds of, of, of writing that I did not know that was out there. I mean, years, you know, introduced to, to writers from, you know, uh, 40, 50, 60, 100 years ago that I have not known. Uh, and that's just not, that's not right. You know, um, I shouldn't have to go through a PhD uh, program to, to learn about uh, these things, uh, and these people, and, um, thank you. you know, and, and as you were saying, Ron, you were talking about the, uh, the, the AP course and, um, the other ways in which there are these, these blocks, uh, uh, these stumbling blocks put in front of people, um, and maybe I'm not using that correctly, but definitely these, these, uh, barriers that are put in front of people, um, to keep them from learning, um, learning the truth. 
And um, so, I mean, poetry is doing a, a wonderful job and it's been, it's been growing steadily. Uh, you know, we have a lot of, lot of programs in different universities and a lot of people want to be there because there is something happening with, with, you know, with this movement, whatever, whatever we want to call it in America, um, where, where people's eyes are being opened and poetry is, is, um, is doing a great deal of that, I think. And, um, so, yeah, so I think, you know, we have to keep encouraging people to read. Okay. So, but I just want to get to you at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So this is a parallel to a Tara. What about you know, where Tara is engaged in her family with a sort of learning experience. Um, your family um, had certain contextual things that they believed and felt also. And so is there is there a contextual issue for you? Uh, is there a kind of back and forth that emerges in your poetry because of... Um, the interaction with your family about this? In other words, I'm, what I'm just trying to say, is there a parallel situation where you are engaged and they're thinking about some of these things and you are in fact um, sharing information with them that makes them see things in a new way that they may not have seen before? Or I'm not saying they have to, I'm just asking it just as, as a question. Absolutely. Uh, you know, like I said, there's a lot of information out there, Ron. There's, there's, there, there are wonderful people who are active, uh, who are actively uh, putting themselves out there and, and sharing this information. Uh, you know, um, even when when it's very dangerous to do so. Uh, right. And so, I think you know what's been very interesting was what COVID did for us all. We all got a chance to kind of just stop for a moment and we we had the opportunity to look around us and see that something wasn't right and uh we got a chance to to listen to things that were happening uh to people who were speaking uh we got a chance to read articles that were coming out uh you know we got a chance to see protests that were ha happening uh near and far Right, uh, all of these things were, were happening, um, and and of course, COVID was the thing that that off that that set it off, uh, and so of course, I'm having conversations with with uh, friends, uh, uh, at least with my mother, <laughs> uh, and you know, we've as as uh, Carolyn Forche said, we've we've all been assembled, right, and so we have all been assembled and so it is it is this um this this breaking away from that narrative that we have been given uh all of us have to do that work uh and so for me i'm talking to 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 people anyone who would listen uh and i don't have the answers you know i don't have all the answers i don't have most of the answers i i'm trying to learn and, and I think the, the dialogue and the conversation is how we get to a place. So uh, I'm definitely having those conversations and, and uh, if, 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 if it's not going anywhere besides from my couch, from me to Tara <laughs> and to social media, it is happening. Uh, there are many conversations and I think what's most important is, uh, you know, we don't have to say a whole lot but we can point people to the people who are saying the things. And, um, you know, I, I think that's, that's, that's the work that we need to do. All right. <clears throat> well, I, I would just make one editorial comment and just simply say, you are um, not writing polemics. Mm. You are saying and writing toward the kind of truth mm. to find a truth. It doesn't require a bibliography to see what somebody else said. Uh, when I read your work, I get it um, firsthand. And that is also something that is 
being shared and is brave and is important. It, I mean, there are lots of resources out there, and yes. there there is an there is a basic uh, indifference. I don't even want to say attack. Maybe it's just more ignorance about the humanities in general, um, about um, potentially that sort of conversation, the humanities being irrelevant. It doesn't lead to jobs. Um, and it's divisive. And it comes up with phrases that get everybody all worked up, like the word woke. So people get focusing on woke or something that's an academic phrase, like critical race theory, which is a very particular thing in higher education that is not taught, to, despite what everybody's fear is, uh, in elementary school. Uh, I mean, it's a highly academic idea uh, that, um, I mean, anyway. So the point is that lived experiences, and the two of you, um, like sharing those and working them through uh, is something that I admire uh, very significantly. Um, and I also am uh, very proud that you folks are um, aligned with Alaska Quarterly, um, that you feel that we're worth your time, because by the way, ultimately at the end of the day, um, the only thing that we really have, and as somebody who's a little older saying it to you, I recognize it very acutely, is time. And to have people who are really, truly in their work as part of our team, um, looking to find a kind of truth through lived experience. So it really, I mean, there are certain things that we know are right and wrong, as, as I said. And so to say, you know, to try to cover it up, uh, and you know, and that, that that has to do with all kinds of things. So we don't need to get into that. But I'm just saying. I mean, in terms of the the, the issues that are now polarizing, you know. Um, but in your case, uh, the two of you are working together, and it's it's so inspiring to see how you have found a shared place to work, and out of which two separate gardens uh, kind of develop with the different kinds of emphases. And yet yeah. the bridges between them are not, um, you know, they're not like small things. They create pathways that are essential to nourish and inform, I mean, metaphor of the forest or whatever it is, if you get the idea. Uh, but they start from very different places yeah. and then they, they, they come to a, a whole. So, um, you folks have any other, uh, I think we probably, um, when I went on a little longer, but I am so impressed with the two of you and what you're attempting to do and as, as you guys will continue to work. And it isn't about advanced degrees that you both will have very soon. Uh, and you already have some advanced degrees already. But it isn't about that. Um, it's about... Um, a life that is engaged in um, seeking truth, messy or not. I mean, the reason why you know you say it's hard and mistakes are made is things are messy. They don't actually they don't actually line up the way you want it to do. People will surprise you. They will have some of them have these traits, but then they have some others that don't seem to go with that. But they it's very much what they do, and you have very complex uh, ideas. So I'm, you know, so this is a way to thank you folks for being uh, on this program uh, with us and uh, continuing to work with Alaska Quarterly. Um, give you an opportunity to say any other final things that we may have left out on this subject. If there is anything that you kind of thought of, well, you know, I wish I had said that about my work or um, meaning the work that you're working on now, like Tara, mm -hmm. you're the project on, um, you know, racism and empire. Uh, <laughs> like, for example, uh, where are you with that? And uh, Sean, um, where mm -hmm. can follow up with where you're at with what you're working on. Sure. And, and then we'll, we'll end before my um, cat makes it. <laughs> She's looking over here. You know why? Because I'm talking too much. <laughs> and so the cat's looking over here thinking, okay. <laughs> so go ahead, well, Tara. Sure. Um, 
I, ha I have, oh boy, with the project, of course, the project is always, uh, we could keep going and keep going. And um, mm -hmm. I, I have a manuscript that I'm hoping will eventually find a home uh, with these poems in it. Um, but I'm continuing to write. Um, and it was such a gift to um, be married to your best friend who also is a poet, because then we get to share ideas together and work through kinks in, in the poetry. And um, so it's, it's such a wonderful thing to be able to have that, um, that help just on the other end of the couch, you know, um, which is wonderful. Uh, but really, I was uh, I'm just going to say, um, and I know that Sean agrees with me here, um, our gratitude for Alaska Quarterly Review, because AQR is willing to have these conversations, um, including essays and stories and poems that that tangle and untangle and address what can be messy. And that's one of the things we love um, about the work that's being done. So thank you for all that you're doing and what AQR is doing for the, the many communities who participate. Yes, and of course I agree with that. So um, yeah, this is this is wonderful, Ron. And, and of course we, we enjoy watching all uh, of the AQR readings. Um, and so uh, I just wanna say that, you know, uh, Tara mentioned the other side of the couch, but um, it's, it's just, it's been, it's been just amazing to be able to do these things together uh, and to be able to hear how she sees things and, and, and how I see things and, and to learn that we're both working through these things together. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's been an uh, amazing uh, few years uh, of, of poetry and, and friendship uh, and so anyhow, um, yes, I agree with everything about AQR. Uh, I'll shout it to the rooftops. And uh, uh, thank you very much for having us tonight. Hey, guys. Well, thank you very much. And to our audience, thank you for um, joining us um, for this program. And um, stay tuned to our channel. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Bye now.